I would like to thank you all for uh, attending today our live webinar on anti-fraud resilience, the latest innovations. Uh, I have a few thank yous. So I, I want to thank um, uh, one of our uh, senior marketing executives, Fran Grovener, who's been um, uh, assisting us in, in running this event. And um, our RSM Fraud and Forensic Services, my team senior manager, Malin Sheth as well, and team. So thank you very much and uh, let's kick off. For those of you who have not met me or, or know me, Roger Darvel Stevens, uh, I'm a partner at RSM Australia, National Head of Fraud and Forensic Services. If you haven't seen one of these webinars before, um, we often, most years we've run these with um, the latest innovations, especially from some of the global conferences that our team are lucky to attend. Uh, to grab the latest and greatest so that we can learn what's new and developing and apply that uh, to our clients in fraud and corruption control and other services. So just a little bit about me, if you, you haven't met me and feel free to you can log on to our RSM website and uh, um, search for me and you'll get my profile or on LinkedIn. Uh, or, or about our fraud and forensic services. But um, RSM, um, if you're not already a client of RSM, we're the sixth largest network of independent audit tax and consulting firms. We are global in 120 countries, 820 offices, and well and truly entrenched in Australia, in capital cities, but very proud of our regional um, presence as well. Uh, it says 98 years there, but I think we're 99 years now, so almost uh, there for our 100th birthday. Brief background on myself, as I said, National Head of Fraud and Forensic Services. Uh, over 30 years of forensic experience, including a forensic partner at a big four accounting firm, EY, and a former police detective. Please don't hold that against me. Um, I'm a certified fraud examiner, CFE, which we'll explain a little bit later, and a licensed investigator in all of Australia and as well as New Zealand. I'm what's called a Regent Emeritus, which sounds very fancy, but that is a person who was previously on uh, the Global Association of Certified Fraud Examiners Board. And so I was a, a member of the board uh, 2012 to 2013. My qualifications include an MBA, Masters of Arts in Criminology, all the sort of um, certificates and diplomas and things that you need for investigative uh, services, as well as fraud and corruption control. What we do uh, before we get into the content, we live, breathe, our team live, breathe and eat fraud and forensic services. So, uh, this is what we provide to clients of RSM. So whether it's forensic accounting, forensic investigation, fraud or forensic data analytics, forensic related training, we do a heap of training for clients, fraud, bribery and corruption control planning, prevention, detection, response, foreign bribery and corruption risk management for clients, forensic IT, whistleblowing, we run our own whistleblowing reporting avenues for clients, and forensic due diligence background checking we do for clients as well. So I'm gonna talk about what we're going to cover today. Before I do so, by way of introduction, you're going to get a copy of these slides if you've registered for this event. So there'll be a follow-up email from Fran Grover or myself uh, in either tomorrow or Monday, and it'll have um, a link or a, a PDF of the slides. So feel free to take photos of the slides uh, as we go if it interests you, but you'll also get a copy, a PDF copy of the slides because there's some um, quite detailed content and references that you can use later on. For those of you or your colleagues who couldn't uh, attend today, uh, we'll be also following up with an email of uh, linking to the video of this presentation so that they can see it, not live, but um, uh, in, in, um, uh, in all its glory as well. So what we're going to cover today. So what is operational resilience? And then in turn, how do we adapt that to fraud and corruption control or other risk areas? 
a summary or, or key points from the long-awaited revised Australian standard, AS8001, 2021 version, Fraud and Corruption Control Standard, which is hot off the press. Whistleblower programs better practice, including the Corps Act whistleblower amendments in 2020 and ASIC guidance. Trends and learnings from a recent 32nd annual global ACFE fraud conference that our team attended. There were 90 sessions and over 5,000 virtual attendees. A roadmap to better practice for fraud and corruption and workplace misconduct control. That is uh, a, an example of a maturity assessment model. And then something that's quite innovative is the Commonwealth Government have produced a pressure testing framework and toolkit, which we don't care where better practice comes from, whether it's government, private sector, professional associations, it's about adapting what's best to mitigate these risks for clients. And it doesn't matter whether you're government or private sector, you can certainly use that Commonwealth Government pressure testing framework and toolkit. And then last, we'll talk about the ISO 37001 anti-bribery system standard and what that means for organisations in Australia. So operational resilience. I know you won't be able to see the detail. I'm going to enlarge this shortly. But basically, if you haven't heard about it, the Open Compliance and Ethics Group, OCEG, is a great organisation that produces a number of flow charts and graphics like this on different business processes. So feel free to go to their website, just Google OCEG. And you, you need to register, but free of charge, you can get a lot of these uh, types of graphics. So this talks about practical operational resilience in the, in the points of anticipating, preventing, adaption, and then responding and recovering. So resilience, it's the ability of an organisation to continue to serve its customers, deliver products and services, and protect its workforce in the face of adverse events. It's understanding and mitigating the potential operational impact of each risk event and their cumulative or synergistic nature is key. Our COVID environment is a classic example that I don't have to preach to you on. The OCEG's practical operational resilience illustration can be applied to any organisation. So with anticipation, um, anticipating events and brainstorming, it's about understanding what can go wrong from the supplier, technology, facilities, and workforce type uh, perspective. Then putting in preventative measures. So establishing indicators, controls, communication and response plans. So this is no different to anything that we come across in fraud or corruption control or financial crime um, for organisations to be able to re react to. And then respond and recover to events, often adverse events as they occur. And so this model can be applied to different types of risk categories, but today we're talking about fraud and corruption. And then adaptation of identifying root causes, implementing new or updated controls and metrics. So building on from that is part of uh, resilience is having these sort of better practice and leading practice benchmark models for you to take into account, have a look at what you have in place in your organisation and compare it against these and see where the gaps are or the improvement opportunities for you to then develop those which can make your organisation robust in its control or more robust in its controls against fraud or corruption or similar type risks. There are a number of better practices. Here are some examples. There's a COZO, Fraud Risk Management Guide. There's a Managing the Business of Fraud Risk, a practical guide from the um, in Institute of Internal Auditors globally, the American CPAs and the ACFE. There's an oldie but a goodie from Circa called Fraud Resistance, a practical guide. There's the ACFE Checkup. There's the Institute of Internal Auditors IPPF practice guide on internal auditing and fraud. And for example, for government, Commonwealth control framework. So I'm gonna talk about a number of better practices. They're just as applicable. And I notice to any organization, and I notice from our attendee list, 
And by the, one, by the way, you're one of 300 people registered for this event. So it's obviously a very interesting topic and something that can be applied directly to your organisation. And so it doesn't matter whether you're government, um, you know, Commonwealth, state or local, uh, or whether your private sector in any way, shape or form, large corporate, global corporate, regional, national, uh, small to medium sized organisation, you can benefit from all of these things. And the Australian Standard 8001 is something that can be uh, proportionately applied to the size and business operation of your organisation. So the background to the Australian Standard 8001, it was a 2008 version, which has been updated now in 2021, which is what we're talking about. There, there is a series of Australian standards called 8000, and there's one on good governance principles. And then as part of that, there's fraud and corruption control, there's also codes of conduct, there's corporate social responsibilities and whistleblower protection programs. So we're talking about 8001 on fraud and corruption control. And this, eight, this 2008 version is now superseded and is replaced. So this graphic, which shows the different um, you know, parts of it, is a lot more fulsome and more explained and updated in this new standard. By the way, I can't give you this standard, so you need to buy standards from organisations like SAI Global um, because they're copywritten. So this one is the display standard, which you can see on the side. But when you buy it, you actually, on your, on, your, on your electronic copy, it will have copy written to whoever purchases it. So um, you can certainly purchase it. It's of a nominal cost and there's a wealth of information in it, as you'll see shortly. So this is how it's set out. And we're going to go into each of these elements. So don't, um, I know the writing's a little bit small, but basically it goes into these um, uh, sections of foundations for fraud and corrupt control, prevention, detection, and response. So it talks about an organization needs to have a fraud and corruption control system. So FCCS. So it's a framework for controlling the risks of fraud and corruption against or by your organisation. So this is also referred to as a fraud and corruption control framework. Then further on, many of you will, you will have fraud and corruption control plans. So there needs to be a way to document this fraud and corruption control system. And so therefore the standard talks about organizations shall document the FCCS uh, with some sort of plan or a document of some sort. So your fraud and corruption control system plan is still very relevant and is something that's needed to be able to give guidance within the organization as to how these risks are being managed. So what are some of the changes and differences? So there's restructuring, but still with an emphasis on fraud and corruption prevention, detection and response. The minimum requirement clarification in terms of shall has been changed from should to do certain things to be able to conform to the standard. Oh, by the way, as we're going, if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat function. I'm not very good at multi multitasking, so I might have to wait until the end to get to your questions, but I can see in the chat log already, there's a few questions, which is great. I'll have to go back to them at the end if that's okay. And if I don't get to them, or you want to ask me a question separately, feel free to email me uh, at any time. So the fraud and corruption control system, also referred to as a framework, uh, replaces the fraud and corruption control plan, but there's documentation still required. So basically a fraud and corruption control system plan is required to document what your organisation uh, does and implements. The standard also harmonises the fraud and corruption control standard, AS8001 2021 version, with another global standard called ISO 37001, which we'll talk about later, anti-bribery management systems. 
There's also a requirement for an information security management system um, consistent with ISO standards on information technology. So with all the prominence of cyber risk to everybody, there's an overlap here without a doubt. Interestingly enough, there are some of these um, references that are normative references, which the standard says for an organisation to be conforming with the Australian standard 8001, they need to also conform to relevant parts to their organisation from these standards. So there's an employment screening standard. Does your HR or people and culture area refer to an employment screening standard in their policies and procedures and apply the principles from within it? Or 31,000 on risk management, or 37001 on anti-bribery management systems, or all the information technology ones, as well as um, the NIST down the bottom for computer security incident handling guide. And also there's, there's some other standards like ASA uh, 240, the auditor's responsibility relating to fraud in an audit of a financial report issued by the Auditing and Assurance Standard Board. There are updated definitions, which I won't go into, but they are um, very informative and good to use in your policies and procedures to get consistency. There are updated guidance on prevention, detection and response for the role of a governing body and top management, specialist resources. So who looks after fraud and corrupt control and especially in any investigations, expertise required for that and safety of that person. So there are some risks to investigators and do you take that into account when you're engaging somebody external like us or internal who has the expertise to do an investigation? External attack, particularly cyber attack, whistleblowing, which we'll talk about a little bit later, workforce and business association screening. So that's your classic um, vendors, business associates, business acquisitions, making sure there's uh, forensic or, uh, or fraud due diligence um, to understand what the risks are or exposures. Fraud and corruption risk assessment, still the foundation for all of this to know what your risks are and what controls you have and where the improvement opportunities may be. Immediate action on the discovery of a fraud or corruption event, including digital evidence first response is included in the standard. And a separation, which is an interesting one of investigation and determination processes. I've long held the belief, and it sounds self-serving because our team do investigations for clients, but it's often very productive for an organisation to get someone external like ourselves to do an investigation so that there's an arm's length engagement to get someone independent to do the investigation and has, have that separation from management who are going to determine what happens out of the investigation and take it from that investigation factual finding report. Fraud and corruption event register. This has always been in place, but it's exemplified or clarified a bit more. It's amazing how many organisations we go into to do fraud and corruption control reviews where they don't necessarily keep that corporate history of what's gone wrong in the past, how it was investigated and how the internal controls fixed it. And especially in forming important key areas like internal audit or risk or governance or compliance areas. Then there's the introduction of pressure testing for internal control systems. So I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail shortly. So just elaborating out on those um, bits. So foundation for fraud and corruption control. I'm just gonna pluck out some of the bits and pieces that I wanna highlight and also is exemplified in the uh, global ACFE conference highlights that I want to mention a little bit later on as well. So certainly awareness raising of fraud and corruption risk. We find there's a lot of demand for clients to deliver fraud and corruption control awareness training for employees and others, and also bespoke areas like we're running a day training um, for clients at the moment and have been doing it on contract and procurement fraud risks. So, so areas where 
there, there's a higher sensitivity or vulnerability to fraud classically. Also fraud and corruption risk management. I think I said it, but if an organization doesn't have a fraud and corruption risk assessment, it's missing the opportunity to know what they don't know. And especially involving external or internal experts in this area. And so uh, it's often the foundation for your fraud and corruption control system to know what your organisation is exposed to, to then mitigate through your fraud and corruption control system. So oh, I mentioned that before, but developing and implementing a fraud and corruption control system is key. And you know, this Australian standard gives you the roadmap and it gives you the points to cover and consider for your organisation. And it says in its pages that it's to be it's to be taken into account the type of organisation you have and to make it proportionate to mitigating your risks and your type of business operation. The next step is preventing fraud and corruption uh, control. Uh, and so, or preventing fraud and corruption. And so some of the, the points here are internal controls and the internal control environment. So especially connected to the work of internal audit, external audit and uh, management in making sure controls aren't just, well, in place for a start, but operating as intended. Because often we see that there are controls or policies and procedures that say these things happen. But then when you actually go through the show me steps or do a process walkthrough, they don't occur leaving great vulnerabilities for organisations. So connected to this is a section in the Australian standard that talks about pressure testing the internal control system. And that's what I'll talk about a little bit later as the Commonwealth government tools and framework for that, which is a very handy, um, innovative uh, document and framework. Detecting. So some of the points I wanted to highlight here, um, data analytics is absolutely key uh, in this area. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but whistleblower management is absolutely key. Whenever we do a fraud and corruption control review for a client, we're very keen on understanding if an employee had some information they wanted to report on any sort of impropriety, where do they go? How do they do it? And can they do it anonymously? Uh, do they feel comfortable doing it? Uh, and we often do staff surveys to gauge a little bit of that culture to see if there's any work that needs to be done there. Another one down the bottom there is exit interviews. If those of you um, uh, don't use necessarily use exit interviews, it is a valuable insight and piece of intelligence gathering as to what's happening in your organisation and sometimes people won't leave um, bad organisations, they'll leave bad managers. And sometimes the managers might be dictatorial, bullying, all sorts of things, which can also be symptomatic of committing fraud or other risk-taking behaviour, like bullying and harassment. Then responding uh, to events. So immediate action on discovery of a fraud or corruption event, investigation of a detected fraud or corruption event. So it's about having an investigation response capability to be able to say, get a core group of people together in a very confidential setting in the organisation say, this has been reported, what do we do with it? Triage it, decide if it's something that can be dealt with internally or you need to get external investigators. You may need to also get ex external investigators or forensic accountants like us through law firms for legal privilege. And so that discussion certainly is valuable and very important. Now I'll move on to whistleblower programs. So uh, I know that Commonwealth and state local government have their own whistleblower legislation. So government is on one side and that's quite well um, matured. And so the same whistleblower encouragement and way of 
um, dealing with whistleblower reports and protecting whistleblowers absolutely applies. And that legislation should be um, certainly covered in full by those organisations as a first step. Then you've got better practice. For private sector organisations, this is absolutely key and a massive change. So the Corporations Act whistleblower amendments came into place in 2020 and it's mandatory for most corporations under the Corporations Act to have this in place. So just going back to um, Fraud Detection 101. So there's a very good source from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, which is their two yearly global fraud study. And there's an Asia Pacific edition of that as well. We use that very regularly. It is a highly reputable source and it is, it's not pushing any particular barrow or trying to guide people in a particular service area or something like that. It is literally just reporting the facts of um, a global fraud study from those who have participated in their survey. So this result of how fraud is detected and who reports it is absolutely consistent across any global or local survey on fraud you can find from any organisation. So an, a, you know, tip off or whistleblower reporting or people having the courage to speak up is the most prominent way that fraud is detected. Next is internal audit. They certainly do a lot of great work in identifying as they're doing their, uh, their uh, internal audit reviews, um, often in, in compliance with a strategic internal audit plan that's been worked out with the, with the client, with the organisation. Uh, and then management review. Management do a great job also in saying, hang on, I should use my professional scepticism here. That doesn't look quite right and then looks into it further. And then if you want to know who reports it, employees are the most uh, um, represented in people who speak up and then customer anonymous, vendor, et cetera. So it's about key to this um, in effectiveness of whistleblower reporting is employees feeling comfortable that they can report something anonymously or not, and that it will get the right management attention and they'll be protected as a whistleblower. So there is legislation for the private sector, the Treasury Laws Amendment Enhancing Whistleblower Protections Act, which amends the Corporations Act. And there's an ASIC guide that goes along with that, which is excellent. So if you're doing this work yourself, you must look at the legislation and must look at the ASIC guidance, which you can freely download from the ASIC website. They've done an amazing job in producing that and giving guidance and examples. And uh, if you're sitting there watching this webinar saying, oh dear, we're private sector, we don't have a whistleblower policy, or if we do, it's, it hasn't been updated in ages, especially not to reflect this legislation, get into it and do it, contact us if you need some help. So brief summary of the whistleblower legislation. An eligible whistleblower, shock and horror, it's a current or a former, the following. So this is where public sector may want to learn from this and say, wow, the Corporations Act has opened this up to a current officer, employee, contractor, et cetera, et cetera, even spouse down the bottom, relative or dependent of one of the above, or a former. And so basically, if I'm an employee at an, a big organisation or a small organisation, I'm seeing something that's fraudulent and I don't know what to do about it. I don't want to lose my job. I, I don't want to be... Um, harassed, bullied or vilified for being a whistleblower and hope that it doesn't come out to anyone else that I'm a whistleblower other than the one I'm reporting to. And I worry about that and wake up at three in the morning and my partner, uh, my wife wakes up to me and says, what are you waking up for? Oh, I'm worried about something at work. And Oh, what is it? And I tell her about it. She can actually be the whistleblower and report it and it can get the attention. So it's amazing, this legislation is quite broad and quite, um, quite advanced. And it's also, there's got some criminal offences in it. 
So for example, it's an offence to disclose information or communicate information likely to identify the whistleblower. And if you've ever done it, it's very difficult in a report to not reference a gender or a whistleblower by name. And so um, that's an absolute um, art form. And then you've got to double and triple check reports to make sure you don't say he or she, and you use they even if it's an individual, and you don't disclose the whistleblower. Uh, so that's one huge change. The next one is what is the policy? What should it contain? So it should contain, and this not should, it must contain from the Corporations Act, the protections available to whistleblowers, to whom disclosures that qualify for protection may be made and how they may be made, how the company will support whistleblowers and protect them from detriment, how the company will investigate disclosures that qualify for protection, which is just about any sort of whistleblowing of improper conduct, how the company will ensure fair treatment of employees of the company who are mentioned in disclosures that qualify for protection or to whom such disclosures relate. So you've got to protect the subject of the complaint or a whistleblower report as well as the whistleblower and anyone else involved. How the policy is to be made available to officers and employees of the company. So I'll give you an example. We often look at an, uh, an organisation's whistleblower um, avenues and go, hang on, this is all internal. This is all an, on the intranet or a policy or procedure someone has to access. This applies to former employees. So how do they access it? So there's got to be something on their website. So someone external, like a former employee or a vendor, current or former, a spouse can access and report. So that's one uh, tip for you. And then there's any other matters prescribed, which I don't know what that is. <laughs> there isn't anything that fits into that category at this point. So what does ASIC say about this? Um, so I'll tell you exactly what ASIC says. So they say this, um, and, and this is a, an article relatively recently. And so, oh, sorry, I've gone too far. Um, so corporate um, whistleblowers um, can be falling short. So a corporate watchdog is urging companies to update their whistleblower protection policies after finding in their own um, study, uh, many firms had not kept up with laws aimed at supporting staff who raised the alarm. Under 2019 um, reforms, laws to protect whistleblowers were expanded as we talked about. However, ASIC, um, Commissioner Cathy Armour, um, this is back in 5 May 2021, said the regulators' review of company whistleblower policies had identified some areas of improvement. Cited a few problems, including that close to half of the policies examined by ASIC did not fully explain how staff could report misconduct and qualify for legal protection. She added that 21% of the policies reviewed by ASIC incorrectly said staff who blew the whistle anonymously would not qualify for protection. So just some tips here, and certainly the last thing you want is a whistleblower complaining to ASIC that your systems aren't compliant with the law and therefore they couldn't do certain things. If you're a movie buff like me, especially in COVID lockdown up and downs and, and easing and increasing of restrictions, you're watching a lot of TV potentially at night and on the weekend and also a lot of streaming shows like uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime and Stan and Binge, I just got recently. So here's a few movies to Google and, um, and find out where they're, where they're showing. If you're interested in some whistleblower movies, some classics like The Informant, Silkwood, The Insider, Serpico, All the President's Men, The Post and Snowden. So hopefully that'll keep you going if you're interested in some of these things. So trends and learnings uh, from the recent 32nd annual global ACFE fraud conference. I mean, what the? 90 sessions, 5,000 virtual attendees. It's crazy. So I've physically been to these conferences before and they're amazing. But of the last two years, it's been virtual. So for those of you who don't know and why I'm banging on about the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners is that it is the key global organization for anti-fraud professionals. 
for money laundering and profession, anti-money laundering professionals, there's ACAMS. For the internal auditors of you, there's the um, Institute of Internal Auditors with their CIA um, certification. For accounting, there's the CA and CPA, and it goes on and on. This is key for um, the anti-fraud professionals of you, or that's part of your job. So it's the preeminent global anti-fraud professional association, 85,000 members globally in 180 countries. The annual conference I'll talk about in a minute. There's a lot of free information you can get on their website without being a member, especially their global fraud study, that last point, that you can freely download now. And there's a lot of good information, especially that you can use as a business case when maybe someone above you in the organisation is saying, what's the business case for us to do this, to implement this or that? There's a lot of good information in there. And then the CFE, I mentioned the Certified Fraud Examiner Credential is a global certification for anti-fraud professionals. So I mentioned the 32nd annual uh, conference, uh, crazy amazing. So um, I've been there before, in, it's always held in, when it's in person in the US, but it's global. And then it's been virtual. And fortunately, uh, my team, my fraud and forensic services team, members at uh, RSM were lucky enough for us all to register. And it's a key part of our learning and keeping up to date with the latest and greatest. So we don't have a lot of time to go through every single bit and I won't go through particular presenters. If you go onto the website and look at the, the, the annual um, global uh, conference that was held and you see a speaker that you wouldn't mind getting more details on, give me a call if you like, and I might be able to assist um, getting some material. So the first theme that came out of it was, there is such an overlap with anti-fraud and cyber security. So what I mean by that is cyber fraud. So at RSM, you know, I lead our fraud and forensic services practice nationally. And that incorporates often an IT element in fraud that occurs, whether it's in investigating or preventing it. There's also a lot more technical um, areas and, um, you know, uh, and, and we have another two partners at RSM um, who specialise in that. So that is a cyber security and resilience set of services and, and run by Darren Booth. Uh, and Ashwin Pell. So certainly I can uh, tee you up with them if you're interested in that. Let me show you a video that's freely available from the ACFE. If you can't find it, send me a, an email that, that you can use in training for, for employees and it's quite good. So let me just uh, cross over to that and play that video. Please tell me Fran, if you can't hear this. Common computer and internet fraud schemes. Technology is a constant factor in almost everyone's life. And as technology advances, fraudsters figure out how to exploit it for their gain. One way fraudsters get access to computers and systems is through social engineering. Social engineering can take the form of phishing, smishing, or farming. In a phishing scheme, the fraudster sends an email claiming to be from a legitimate organization the victim does business with, or from a person within the victim's organization. Fraudsters manipulate the victim into providing sensitive information, which they then exploit. Smishing is a similar scheme, but the fraudster contacts the victim through text messages. In a farming scheme, the victim enters sensitive data into a web page that is designed to look like a legitimate website, such as a bank site. Unlike the phishing scheme, farming doesn't require the victim to click a link in an email, but rather the fraudster manages to control a domain and redirect legitimate traffic to their fake site. Once they've gained access to a computer system, fraudsters often install malware. Popular types of malware include worms, which self-replicate and spread to other computers and systems, spyware, which collects data about the computer user, like their demographic information, 
and search history without the user's consent. Key loggers, which track everything a computer user types. This can be used to gain passwords and other login information. And ransomware, which locks users out of a computer system and demands payment to access it again. To learn more about how to protect against computer and internet fraud schemes. So I hope you found that valuable, but then these little snippets are really good for employee uh, education. And I'm sure your IT areas in your own organizations will be all over this as well. Just to give an example too of some of the, you know, at the, the conference, there are a number of different fraud schemes that were raised. And I'll just give you one example. If you're not a, a connection with me on LinkedIn, um, please feel free to invite me to be a connection. And then you'll see that a very, re uh, very um, regularly I post a what the fraud, WTF post of global and local fraud and corruption and other improper conduct uh, techniques, cases, convictions, scams that have occurred. And so here's one of them. And so um, this is the, um, a, a bit of a variation on the theme. So uh, the traditional phishing scams with fraudsters. So what happens is they do the phishing scam, but what they do, which is a variation on the theme, is instead of just relying on the employee to click on the link, they actually ring up the employee and say, you know, whether they say they're from the organisation or the IT help desk or whatever, and they say, We've just sent you an email just to say it's all safe. Just click on the link and that'll get you access to X, Y, Z. And so people feel more comfortable to click on it. That's just an example, a small example of the sort of innovations, the sort of different techniques that are developing as criminals get smarter and smarter in this area. The next one is on fraud awareness training. So that was definitely highlighted. There's a 2021 just out, another key document for you to download if, if, if you're interested in this area, Fraud Awareness Training Benchmark Report from the ACFE, which talks about 71% of organisations provide fraud awareness training uh, to employees. The role least likely to receive fraud awareness training is the board of directors with 14% of organisations providing no fraud awareness training to their board. Surprising, isn't it? You do it for employees, but not to the board or maybe audit committees or other committees. 91%, the most commonly covered topic is red flags of fraud, which is included um, in fraud awareness training programs. 66% of organisations make fraud awareness training mandatory for all employees. So don't feel guilty if you say, oh, I don't want to make it mandatory. You know, will I get in trouble doing that? Well, there's, there's some good example benchmark material saying that here's what most organisations do. Online on-demand training modules are the most popular approach present in 78% fraud awareness training programs. And fraud awareness training is provided at least in part by internal personnel at 85% of organisations. And we're finding now with, with vehicles like Zoom and MS Teams that, you know, it is such an efficient way. So it used to be in-person training. Clients would really love, but it can be costly and, and multiple to cover their, their, um, their uh, population of, of employees. But then online training of click and tick may not be as effective. And so this is very effective in delivering training to as many people as you like um, virtually in a one hour session or similar, um, uh, for example. Now, there's another um, very good benchmark called the 2020 ACFE Anti-Fraud Playbook came out last year. That talks about similar things to what the Australian standard talks about, but provides just some more information and context which you can use in implementing the same things as AS8001 2021 version. Uh, this can assist you as well because it's the same type of elements. This is split into slightly different categories of fraud risk governance, understanding where you are and where you want to be, a culture of fraud risk um, uh, control, uh, fraud risk assessment, think like a fraudster, discover what you don't know. Fraud control activities, use the data to uncover fraud. Knowledge is power. Fraud investigation and corrective action, uh, lay the groundwork for how you conduct your investigation. Fraud risk management monitoring activities. 
And so strongly encourage you to download that one as well. Here's an example of just, I kind of like this. Uh, maybe I'm a bit fraud, anti-fraud geeky with all this stuff because I love the leading practice stuff, but uh, and then implementing it for clients and seeing the actual results. Uh, so here's steps of a fraud risk assessment. So it, it quite easily puts it into a framework where you can include that in material of people that are being involved in a fraud risk assessment in an organisation so they can understand the process. Uh, data analytics, anti-fraud technology benchmark report is really important. We also have a partner at RSM, uh, Surgeon um, um, Dragonovic, uh, if I've got his pronunciation correct, who's our uh, partner in charge of data analytics. He's awesome and does a lot of work for clients. Um, we also incorporate in some of our projects data analytics elements because it's not mutually exclusive and we, we often uh, work with Surgeon. So this document is only out in the last two years and so well and truly worth looking at as well. Just to give you a snippet, I like this slide because what it does is it says on the top bar, it's got what are the most common analytic techniques. And then down below is what are those common programs that people use? So you can go, oh, exception reporting and anomaly detection. Well, we use Excel, but maybe we should consider with ACL or SAP or whatever we want to do. Or, oh, I haven't even looked at uh, emotional tone sentiment analysis uh, or geographic data mapping or link analysis or social network analysis. So. Um, it's, it's great, great insight into what organisations are doing and what you could pick up on. There's also a benchmark report and these were examples or these are the topics that were covered in, by a lot of the speakers. So I'm using the, the, the sort of um, publications that you can download and get value out of for your own organisation to exemplify those topics. This one's a, uh, and I've never seen it from any other organisation, an in-house fraud investigation teams benchmark report. So you may not be big enough to have a large investigation team, but if you do, this allows you to benchmark yourself against other organisations and how they run their investigation functions. You could be a bank, financial institution, and say, oh, well, you know, we're missing out on anything with our team. Like here's the top three professional qualifications desired for fraud investigators professional licenses and certifications, prior investigation experience and relevant education and degrees. So for example, um, there's the certified fraud examiner is most commonly used by investigators, but then you've also got your, your chartered accounting, CPA, certified internal auditor, certified information system auditor, um, a certified anti-money laundering specialist, uh, private investigator and, and onwards. I've mentioned the ACFE and the Certified Fraud Examiner course. It sounds self-serving, but we happen to be RSM uh, and our team of Fraud and Forensic Services happen to be the exclusive authorised trainers in Australia for the ACFE for delivering the four-day instructor-led CFE exam review course. Many of you on this uh, webinar may have done our course or be registered for courses. We've got one coming up shortly in October, and then we're running a similar uh, range of these next year in 2021 in March, July and October. And it covers basically a day of investigations, a day on international law principles, a day on financial transactions and fraud schemes, including red flags and getting into the detail, and a day on fraud prevention and deterrence. So a roadmap to better practice. So we're getting close to the end and we're bang on time. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest to you is, of course, the AS8001 2021 is a roadmap to better practice. And of course, it has um, all the things that I showed you in basically that's the table of contents, but there's also a structure for what they suggest as fraud and corruption control system documentation in the standard on pages, I'm looking at it now, from pages 15 to 17. So it gives you a tick list and guidance as to what should be included in your documentation and then implemented in your organisation. 
But something else that I think is excellent is the ACFE anti-fraud playbook have an enterprise anti-fraud maturity assessment model, which is, I think, the latest and greatest. And it's not that difficult, it's simple, but it's great to, for an organisation to plot themselves against and say, where are we at? Is our anti-fraud or fraud and corrupt control system ad hoc and we do it bits and pieces here and there? Is it initial where we're starting to get organised? Is it repeatable? where it's actually getting more streamlined with policies and procedures and how we do things? Or is it managed level four and humming along like a well-oiled machine? Or is it leadership that, hey, you should present at the next global ACFE um, fraud conference because it's a good example of benchmark practice for an organisation. So you can see the ingredients there. If you download the anti-fraud playbook, it goes into a lot more detail to give you some insight there as to how you can apply that or get an organisation like us to apply it in doing a review. So the last area we're covering is the Commonwealth Government Pressure Testing Framework and Toolkit. So bottom line is AS8001 refer to, in, in the fraud and corruption control system, refer, refer to fraud pressure testing. So that was released 11th of June, by the way, the AS8001. So pressure testing is really the assessment aimed at the effectiveness or not of internal controls that are specifically designed or intended to mitigate fraud and corruption risk. It involves internal and external individual or teams using a range of methodologies to test the effectiveness, identifying gaps or improvement opportunities while assisting in deterring fraudulent attacks by pressure testing activities. The mere fact that someone is looking into this will be known by employees and will spread like wildfire, which is a good thing and a good deterrent. If any of you haven't gone to the Commonwealth Fraud Prevention Centre, I strongly recommend it. It was only developed a couple of years ago. It's very innovative. It's an awesome Commonwealth Government initiative. It's got a lot of leading practice, better practice on it, all links to where you can go. And so I strongly suggest you just Google it and go to it. And it has this, a Commonwealth pressure testing framework, which talks about targeted assessments, critical assessments, comprehensive assessments. And it's got a range of tools and tips and, and all the rest of it for you to look at and apply. So I can't go into the detail, but suffice it to say, I'm attracting your attention to it if it's of value to you using it in your own organisation. And to finish off the International Standard 37001, there's a Global Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index, which rates every country in its level of um, corruption. And what that leads to is here are the, high, are the highest, sorry, the least corrupt countries in yellow or the most corrupt countries in red or purple. But what it leads to is there is an anti-bribery management system and a set of controls that are there. So if you have any connection with overseas of using agents, intermediaries, exporting, importing, you have overseas operations or you're part of a regional or overseas um, set of entities, you need to have foreign bribery and corruption or anti-bribery compliance. We have one client at the moment who's very innovative and has the foresight to engage us to develop their fraud and corruption control system documentation into a revised fraud, bribery and corruption control system plan and then implementation, which we're working through at the moment so that this covers this because that organisation does have some connection to overseas. Um, just to end up on this, by the way, there is pending legislation uh, because the Commonwealth Criminal Code Act outlaws foreign bribery for Australian people or anyone in Australia or from Australia acting overseas, you can be prosecuted by the Australian Federal Police for, for breaching that legislation. Is, and you can read here from Transparency International that there's been a lag in some amendments that have been considered by Parliament. And it, I'll read it. The past month has had its disappointments. The long overdue combating corporate crime bill amendments again failed to make it into the list and be debated in Parliament. 
The bill proposes, amongst other measures, a new corporate offence of failing to prevent foreign bribery, expands the scope of the foreign bribery offence and will introduce the deferred prosecution agreement scheme. If you fit into that category, you must have to, it's legislative compliance to have something in place for this and be aware that there might be legislative changes to enhance it. If you need a hand, just call out to us. I'm now finished, happy to take some questions. So I will uh, stop sharing my screen now. And I will actually go to the chat. And we only have a minute till we finish, but we do, we can go a little bit over for questions. So apologies. If you have to sign off because you've got to stick to the one hour that we, we told you about, totally understand. Otherwise, I'll answer some questions for, for a few minutes. So uh, I wanted to, uh, I'm just going through those questions now. Oh, someone's just said the CFE review course is excellent, highly recommended. That wasn't a friend of mine, but it is someone who's probably done the course before. So um, um, much um, uh, obliged and thank you for that. Roger, we have had one question come in um, from Bernadine. So she's wondering what are the major differences between a framework and a plan? Yeah, sure. That's an excellent question. So your framework is your system. Your plan is how you document that, basically. So you're documenting it so that it is there and it can be scrutinised by an external auditor or an internal auditor or an external body that, that comes and reviews the organisation. And then, of course, that plan is just a policy and a procedure in one. It has to be implemented. So the plan is basically how your fraud and corruption control system slash framework is documented and implemented. Thank you for that. Um, I've got one question here on how we apply what was presented to the not-for-profit sector. Absolutely. So there's definitely an applicability to the not-for-profit sector. And if you have a look at the ACNC website, um, you'll see that there's a lot of reference. Um, and what I mean by that is the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission They've got pages and references um, to uh, fraud and corruption control and also whistleblower protection. So it directly relates to exactly what we're talking about and that completely corroborates um, what I'm talking about. So directly applies. And we, we RSM, have a number of not-for-profit clients where we run a whistleblower program as well as other services in fraud and corruption control, because it's such an important sector when there's um, money that is important not to be squandered or at risk when it needs to be given to um, those who most uh, are in need of it. Any other questions before we finish up? Uh, We've had one come through, um, Roger, which was, what should be the key anti-fraud focus areas for a small fraud management team of two people? Yeah, excellent. I love it. So you can still apply this to a small team and just be really truncated on what it is. The key part is segregation of duties and making sure that not one person has full control of a whole process. We've investigated many frauds where uh, even the most loyal, long-standing employee, something changes in their life and they turn into a fraudster. And because they can do a whole lot of things in a process, they are controlling that whole process and then commit fraud until months or maybe years later till it's discovered, even in small to medium-sized organisations. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Fran. And I see another one there saying... Uh, just wondering, I, I work for what uh, for a water authority. What is the cutoff for implement, implementing the new AS8001 2021? Excellent question. I should have clarified, and I appreciate that because you, you prompted me to clarify that any standards are guidance. They're not law. They're not obliged for you to comply with. They're, con you, they're for something for you to conform with or get guidance from. And organisations who really want to 
work on this area, make sure that they're conforming with the Australian Standard 8001 2021. So there is absolutely no cutoff date. It is completely discretionary on your organisation as to when and how you want to implement or learn from this guidance to make it more robust in your organisation that controls to mitigate the risks of fraud and corruption. I don't think there's any other questions, Fran, would that be right? I think that's it for now. Um, any other final ones come through? I think a few people have left as well, so we should be yeah, good to sure. wrap up. So, so if you have any other questions, queries, and I haven't answered them or you don't want to ask on a in a public forum, please feel free to, to email me and um, certainly more than happy to follow up, more than happy to have a chat, uh, a, you know, an MS team, video conference, whatever, to chat about your business and what you can do um, most to help yourself in this area. So don't hesitate to message me in any way, shape or form, LinkedIn, email, phone or whatever. And um, probably myself and my um, senior manager, Malin Sheff, can meet with you virtually, often in these days of lockdown, uh, to, to discuss any aspects in a free, no obligation uh, basis. Thank you, everybody, for your time and appreciate that, appreciate the number of people that registered and have a great day and from RSM, stay safe.